Well, it's a great pleasure to be here to give this lecture. Um, I've long wanted to, to give a Gresham College uh, lecture, and now I'm fulfilling an ambition. Um, I'm a chemist, as you have heard, and so I thought I should establish my credentials at the beginning by doing a little chemistry of the sort that you might find familiar. So in this very expensive vessel that we have here, I have two uh, reagents which could react, but they will not do so under the conditions of this room unless I provide a small amount of energy called the activation energy, which gets them over an energy hump and then the reaction can proceed. So I'm going to provide that energy in a form that everybody would find familiar, which is uh, just in the form of heat. So if I turn this up the right way and apply some heat, Well, <clears throat> few would doubt that chemistry took place there. Uh, notice I have another one. Uh, in fact, I have two more. If I see anybody nodding off during this hour, I <laughs> shan't hesitate to use it. But the real purpose of showing you that is to say that uh, this is chemistry driven by a form of energy, uh, the form of energy being heat. My kind of chemistry is different because I study chemistry which is caused by light. So I'm a photochemist. Um, let me just put that out the way there. Good. So um, light is uh, a form of energy, and I want to show you that with this simple device here, which is just a solar cell constructed by BP Solar. And I'm going to simply shine the light from this rather feeble torch that you can see. You can probably see certainly at the front that this is not moving at the moment, but if I apply the light, can you see it spinning round and round? Is that obvious to everybody? If I take the light away, it will stop. I don't think there's enough light up there to keep it going. It takes a while to go down, it's just slowing down now. Works best if I put it in the dark, but there we, can you see it's, it's slowed right down and now has just about stopped because there's enough light from those arc lights to keep it going. So there, yeah, it now has stopped. And so if I do it again, the only, the only source of energy going into that device is the light from this torch. And the, um, what it does is the solar cell turns it into electricity, which drives a little electric motor, which turns this thing around. It's purely for demonstration purposes. Uh, you notice it was made by BP. I've shown this all over the world, but not in the southern United States. So, uh... <laughs> so I hope I've demonstrated light is a form of energy, <clears throat> and it's very easy to make light. So over here, I can move it back over. I have a device, a toy, which many of you will have seen, I'm sure. Uh, this is just a, a plasma globe. I'm passing a high frequency, radio frequency discharge through a gas. I'm exciting the gas, and the gas loses its excess energy by giving out light. Now, it's not terribly uh, good form of light, but notice if I put my finger on the top, can you all see that? the stripe of light going to my finger is much brighter than the others. Uh, and if you think about that, it means more electric current must be flowing through that pathway than the others. And that electricity is passing through my arm and down through my body into the ground. I'm acting as an earth for this device, but I'm perfectly happily standing here doing this. So it can't be much of a current, that's the point. Now, if you needed further evidence of that, if I could find what I've done with, ah, I did have a big tube, what have I done with it? Anybody see a, maybe there's another one in here, let me have a look. Sorry about this. No. Ah, here it is.
This is the backup. So that's how it works. Just an ordinary fluorescent light tube, the sort you'd have in your kitchen or your, your bathroom. And if I hold it near there, can you see it all lights up? Now, you know these things don't light up spontaneously, so there must be an electric current passing through the tube and then down through my arm. And if you wanted final proof of that, if I hold it halfway down, only half the tube lights up, all right? <laughs> and the point of showing you that is that it takes a tiny current to produce a considerable amount of light. It's a very efficient way of producing a form of energy which is incredibly useful uh, in, in the world we live in. Now, I could talk at great length about all kinds of things, um, chemistry in the atmosphere, uh, photosynthesis, but I've restricted my talk today to something which has interested me for all of my research life, and that is the reactions of, of uh, molecules when they're excited by, by light, uh, and in particular, the apl applications of that subject to medicine, because I think most of us are interested in our own welfare. So, uh, where did this all begin? Well, in, in its modern form, photomedicine started with a man called Niels Finsen. Now, I need to find out how to do the, the slides, which uh, the next slide should be... Oh, well, that just explains in some detail what photochemistry is. And I thought, ah, well, it's the end of that one. I, got, <laughs> I have a spare, so it's all right. Um, I've, I've produced some notes for you to take away, and you'll see some of the description here in the notes, so I won't bore you with it now. Uh, but the man I'm really getting around to talking about is uh, Niels Finsen. In the 1880s, he was a Danish physician, uh, and he was also an amateur scientist. And so he um, made the observation that people who had tuberculosis, which is very common in those days, and sadly is becoming very common again in our time, uh, caused by a bacterium, of course, and now we have drug-resistant bacteria. He noticed that people who had tuberculosis developed terrible sores on their face, lupus vulgaris. And he noted that in Denmark, there were fewer people exhibiting these sores than there in the summer months than there were in the winter months. And so he reasoned that maybe um, the sunlight was curing the sores. Not curing the TB, but curing the sores. So he decided to do an experiment. Uh, he got hold of a patient with terrible facial sores, and here's my patient with terrible facial sores, can you all see? Uh, and he got hold of a newly available carbon arc lamp, which I have here. And he just took a patient with the sores and applied the full output of the arc lamp onto, onto the face of the patient. With a nice singeing result there. <laughs> And that, sadly, is what happened to the patient. The experiment, <laughs> experiment was a total disaster uh, because he didn't cure the sores, but he did give the patient third-degree burns, <laughs> which he was able to treat, of course. Well, a lesser man might have given up at that point, but he started to reason, what had I done? What had he done? And I uh, lost the control. There it is. Uh, if you look at what he had done, he'd taken the full arc of the carbon arc lamp, which has a considerable amount of visible light, as you saw, a huge amount of infrared light, heat, and a tiny amount of ultraviolet light. Uh, and so he thought, well, maybe uh, it was the um, ultraviolet light, which is... Uh, the, the, uh, the visible light was may be important, uh, or per perhaps the ultraviolet, and the infrared was clearly just a nuisance. Well, it's very easy to get rid of infrared radiation. Uh, you simply pass the light through water. Maybe news to some of you that the, the biggest greenhouse gas we have in the atmosphere 
is not carbon dioxide, it's water vapor. Uh, so he did a second experiment. Somehow or another, mine managed to find another patient, presumably not the first one again. Uh, and this time he passed the light through a, 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 a glass vessel containing water, and this time partial success. He didn't burn the patient, but then he didn't cure the sores either. And then he thought, well, glass does not transmit ultraviolet light. So maybe it's the ultraviolet. So he then uh, produced a, a quartz vessel which transmits ultraviolet with the water in it. And uh, sure enough, he was able to successfully treat a patient. Uh, and here you see that patient, uh, an, an early photograph. You see what the, what the sores look like, not very pleasant. Uh, this is afterwards. Of course, it doesn't happen instantaneously. You have to wait a little while and the scabs drop off. And then she looks perfectly normal. And you'd think she'd be smiling broadly now, wouldn't you? <laughs> but she was a Scandinavian lady and they didn't smile too much in those days. And <laughs> if you have any doubts about that, just read some more Ibsen and you'll find out all about it. So he started it off and it sounds like a trivial uh, it, uh, experiment he did, but for the treatment, he was awarded one of the first Nobel Prizes in medicine in the year 1903. So it was figured to be uh, something of worth. So what's the modern subject now? Well, it's the effects of light on the skin. It's the uses of light to diagnose medical conditions. It's the therapeutic effects of non-laser light, and it's the use of lasers. And I want, in the time I have available, just to briefly touch on many of those things. So let's start with the skin. The first effect of light on the skin is very positive. And so I have a plus put against it, and that's the production of vitamin D. If you don't have enough vitamin D as a child, you develop the condition rickets. And here we have three infants. Uh, the one in the middle is normal, these children, both on the outside, both have rickets. And because vitamin D fixes calcium in the body, if you don't have enough of it, you don't fix the bones properly, and so you develop this permanent state of affairs. So it's a condition which has been relatively unknown recently, but in Victorian Britain, where People worked in the great satanic mills and uh, went to work in the dark, came home in the dark, didn't see any sunlight during the day. Uh, it was very common in, in Victorian industrial Britain. At the same time, it was virtually unknown in India uh, because of the strong sunlight that they, that they experienced. Sadly, in our day, it's becoming a problem again uh, because particularly in, in northern cities, particularly amongst immigrant populations from South Asia who have the habit of covering up their, their bodies. They don't get enough sunlight, but it's easily recognized and easily treated with a dietary supplement. I mean, there's no, there's no problem there now. So that's a plus. I've also put a plus here against tanning, the coloration of your skin, and it doesn't matter what color your skin is, it will darken under the influence of ultraviolet light from the sun, it's just much more visible in a Caucasian skin than it is in other skins. Uh, and we tend still to associate tanning with a feeling of well-being because it usually happens when we're on holiday, somewhere nice, we deliberately expose our skins. And whilst that's good for your vitamin D production, it's really not very good uh, for the condition of the skin uh, because uh, tanning is trying to protect it, the, the skin trying to protect itself against degradation by the sun. And the two effects of, of too much sunlight are aging and skin cancer, and I talk, talk about both of those. So let's do a little experiment, perhaps. Uh, I'd like you to grab uh, the skin on the back of your hand, and when I say go, uh, just see how long it takes for the skin to go back in position. Ready, steady, go. Now, we haven't got many young people here today, <laughs> uh, if, if I can be so insulting. Um, 
But youngsters, the skin goes back immediately because they still have a young, elastic skin. When you get older, and I'm a good example, you lose that elasticity, so people in the front can testify that when I let go, it still hasn't gone back into position now. So the skin on the back of my hand resembles that of an elderly lizard. <laughs> and why, but I, I can show you this, well, I won't show you, but there's skin <laughs> elsewhere in my body which looks uh, young and fresh and, and re relaxes immediately back to where it came from. So what's the difference between the skin on my hand and the skin on my body? Well, I've been staggering around this planet just short of 77 years, and all of the time I've been uh, alive and working and living and doing general things, I have not covered up my hands. So there has been an accumulative dose of ultraviolet light from the sun on my hands, which have led to the degradation of the skin, which is a one-way ticket. Once it's gone, it's gone. You can't get it back again. Despite what it might say on some very expensive potions you might buy and <laughs> see advertised in magazines, uh, don't believe it. You can lubricate your skin. You really cannot rejuvenate it. So, uh, it, it is uh, very common to have this kind of skin degradation. This man is an interesting case. He's a truck driver in Arizona. Arizona has very strong ultraviolet light. And he was in the habit of driving with the, his window down. And you can see the result. He, uh, he has a degraded skin on this side, which is what was receiving the direct sunlight, and rather younger looking skin on the other side. And uh, he became a kind of celebrity because of this deformity, if you like. Well, I like to show young people um, a picture of a, a lady who maybe you sort of enjoyed this experience to Quickened the pulse of young man when I was 16. This was the, 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 the film star that everybody loved. And she had a lovely skin, but she was in the habit of sunning herself on the beaches of Saint-Tropez. And so what does she look like now? She looks like that. Notice that there's a lot of uh, degradation of the skin under the chin. Uh, and it's not hard to figure out why that is. You get reflected light from surfaces which gets you just under there. It tends to be soft skin which degrades. So when young people see that, they're always appalled by it and they think it's horrible, to which I usually retort, it will happen to you too. Uh, and the only difference is what is the rate at which it happens. So the take-home message really for that is if you, if you sunbathe, use sunscreens. Don't get too big a dose all at once. And of course, there are much more sinister things happen and we're gonna to come to that a bit later. So there we have um, a, a little look at the, the skin. Skin is interesting, actually. It's, a, it's counted as an organ in your body, and it's actually the heaviest organ in your body. Uh, it weighs uh, many kilograms, and uh, you can't take it off, of course, so you, you can't really weigh it properly. Uh, right. Um, this is um, Moving towards diagnosis, diagnosis of conditions. It's not so long ago, historically, that you would only seek treatment from a, the uh, uh, medical fraternity if you had an obvious symptom. You had a fever or an ache or pain or whatever. But many of the diseases that we suffer from are caused by uh, microbes, uh, caused by alien invasion of your body, if you like. And so it would be very, very desirable if we could find out what invaders, if you like, the body is carrying before any symptoms develop. And so screening using uh, immunochemistry, immuno immunometric assay, is very commonly used. So you take an antibody, which is a specific um, protein raised in your body to to lock onto, to recognize by shape, one of these invading species. Take one of these and immobilize it on the wall of a test tube, and if, you, if you like. Then you add the sample that you're trying to test. It might be blood, urine, any, any liquid sample, really. Uh, and if this is present, this is the antigen, it will lock onto the antibody, 
schematically represented there. And then the trick is to put a second antibody in, which is labeled in some way. This yellow one cannot bind directly to the blue one, but it will bind to the brown one. And if that uh, has been immobilized on the surface, then you've got your, your signal that you want. So what kind of light can you use? It used to be radioactivity that was used, uh, but how much more convenient to use light? Well, there are various forms of light you could use. And I want to show you just a couple of them. And I didn't take these out beforehand. This is just a, 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 a tube which uh, contains two chemicals. And when I break a, a file inside and mix them, I should get a reasonably bright light from, there we go. Uh, and I've got various different colors. Uh, some of them are quite old, so they might not work, so I'll put that one up there somewhere, all right? <laughs> Teachers go hairless when I actually do this in schools. <laughs> ah, anybody vote conservative? They're, they're <laughs> up there, maybe? I'm not going to throw them too far because uh, they quite solid. Liberal, anybody? <laughs> there we go, maybe up there. And just pass them back so people can see them. So that's chemical light, chemiluminescence. And it's uh, an interesting process. You have in that, those tubes, there is some strong peroxide uh, which reacts with a the molecule there, which is an, an oxalate, uh, and that uh, an oxetane, sorry. Uh, and that produces an excited electronic state which emits light but very feebly. And the dye stuffs are put in which take that feeble light and turn it into much stronger uh, fluorescence. So that technique is actually used in a variety of immunoassays. Uh, <coughs> you can detect pregnancy within the first 48 hours. Uh, of it being established, I choose my words carefully here, um, where they, you're, you're looking for the human chorionic gonadotrophin, the, the, uh, the hormone. So very early on in pregnancy, you can detect it, and sometimes that's necessary. So very early, but not quite as early as is shown there, but not, not long after this, uh, you can detect the pregnancy. Well, do you have to use chemical light? No, you can use... Um, a, uh, a form of emitted light which is uh, induced itself by light. And I just want to show you very briefly here with a rather simple and, and really quite wrong model, but I show it anyway. If you take the hydrogen atom, it has one positively charged species uh, proton at the, the, the nucleus, and it has one electron which fills the space, uh, in this case a circle, but would be uh, a sphere in, in, in the, the real world. And when light is absorbed, when light of the correct frequency is incident on this hydrogen atom, you simply jump the electron from one place to another. And that has a huge amount of excess energy now. And it can't do anything with it as an atom unless it collides with something else. And so all it does is wait a little while and then it drops back down to the original orbital uh, and light is given out. And that's, that's a luminescence that you would see, a photoluminescence, in fact. Now, there's things wrong with this model, and I won't dwell on them, but the size of the nucleus is absurd because if this was filling the whole of West Ham Stadium, I choose that wisely since I listened to the news this morning, uh, then the actual nucleus would be the size of a housefly or a pea placed at the center spot. It's, it's tiny, but very heavy. Uh, and also, if there are physicists amongst you, you will realize that that transition, a spherical orbital to another spherical orbital, is not allowed by the uh, selection rules in a, in a transition. It has to go to a dumbbell-shaped orbital, uh, which I, I can't make the ball do that. So, uh, but you get the point, that it's an electron jumping from one place to another. And it happens in molecules, too. So you can have a fluorescence from a whole variety of different molecules, and some of them you saw in those tubes. So what do we have here? Well, we have um, 
This one absorbs ultraviolet light and gives out blue light. There's a red shift. There's a loss of energy before the molecule emits. Uh, that's the most dramatic because you see a big change. Uh, this one looks kind of yellowish but has a bright yellow fluorescence. Uh, the red ones are disappointing because they look red because you're absorbing blue and green light and they emit red also. So it's the blue one which is perhaps the most interesting one. And fluorescence is everywhere around us and I like to show you this and after the, the morning's drive I just had I need a, a little uh, uh, something. You can probably see what that is, can you? It's, a, it's the new colors of a Schweppes uh, tonic water. And I'm going to drink it just to, I would hate to drink this, the, the blue one I just showed you, because it's a uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, which would give me cancer. So I'm not gonna drink that, but I'm quite happy to drink some of this. But in order to make it palatable, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to add a little of this. <laughs> which I never fake experiments, this is the real thing. <laughs> but I must remember I've got to drive home. I once gave a presentation at Imperial College four times in a row and I, I didn't quite know where I was at the end. Okay, um, so what's interesting about this substance is it has a bright blue fluorescence. I'm sure many of you knew that, uh, but it's got quinine in there, quinine uh, sulfate, and it's a, it's a fluorescent standard in fact. But just to show you I'm not cheating, I'm going to drink it. You're very good health. <laughs> Who says there are no perks in giving uh, <laughs> academic lectures? All right. <clears throat> Using fluorescence has revolutionized biology and medicine in the last 15 years. Why? Well... It's due to a chance observation by a Japanese gentleman, Shimamura, uh, who uh, observed that a, a particular jellyfish, Aquaia victoria, uh, had a green fluorescence. And he identified that it was a particular protein in the, uh, in the uh, jellyfish which gave this green fluorescence. I got a little sample there, but it's quite feeble, so I won't, I won't show you. So there's the jellyfish. Uh, you could extract the gene from the jellyfish, which gives you this green fluorescent protein, and you can splice that gene into any living organism, and that's the value of it. You can actually label any part of a human body, of a, an animal body, any living organism can be labeled using this green fluorescent protein. Uh, that's what the GFP actually looks like. I, I won't dwell on it. It has a a kind of barrel protective shape, but the, the active bit is just a series of three amino acids which are joined together. Actually, that's not quite true because what happens when you irradiate them is you get some chemistry takes place and it's the product of the chemistry which is the fluor fluorophore, but we don't want to make it too complicated, do we? So everybody, the, the world and his wife, has used green fluorescent protein and in 2008, the three scientists responsible for this, Shimamura the first, and then Roger Shane, who sadly died two weeks ago, uh, and the one who I can never remember the name of, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, our own work has actually used this uh, to look at the immune system and this is something you may not know, a different colored laser pointer. This is one of your cells and there's an apparatus called the major histocompatibility complex which displays on the surface of the cell all of the proteins that you make inside your, the, the cell. And a T cell in your immune system interrogates this and it's looking for these proteins and if there's a protein there that shouldn't be there because your cell has been infected then it will turn on the full might of the immune system and kill that cell, destroy it. But some viruses have learned how to remove the apparatus which displays the proteins. So the T cell can't identify anything that's wrong and so this infected cell would continue to, to grow. 
Well, you have a second line of defense, which is called the natural killer cell. And this is not looking for the protein, it's looking for the apparatus. And if it finds a cell that hasn't got this MHC, then again, it will be destroyed. So you have sort of two lines of defense against uh, infection. Well, we, I won't describe in any detail this, but here is something that we did with my colleagues in biology and in Imperial College and, and in physics. Uh, here's a target cell, here's a natural killer cell, and this one is interrogating that one. And this is the MHC, which we've labeled with green fluorescent protein. And what, if, what occurs is as soon as there's contact made between these two, all of the MHC and the outside of this target cell will migrate to the synapse, the, the junction between the two cells. And that happens very quickly, in a matter of seconds. Uh, and this is uh, something that wasn't known before. And the studies we've done are actually the, the nature of that interaction uh, and what can you do to, uh, to recognize it and to, to uh, use it to destroy cells. So I said you can label anything using a, a green fluorescent protein. I thought you might be amused by this. This was in Nature a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a cat who was being investigated. He was, he, a protein was, uh, a GFP was, was uh, used in the body. And the result is that he has become a fluorescent cat. That wasn't the purpose of the exercise. There was some real biochemistry being carried out here. You see his whiskers uh, fluoresce quite nicely, and his claws particularly. So this is not a mechanism, so you can go out at night with an ultraviolet lamp and look for your lost moggy. Uh, this was a serious uh, experiment. Let's move on to therapy. Um, this is the uses of light to, dis to treat disease. And it includes uh, treatment of psoriasis and vitiligo using ultraviolet light and a sensitizer called Sorolin. Uh, it's using red light and a, a, a technique called photodynamic therapy, which I have been involved with for a long time. It's blue light used to treat neonatal jaundice, newborn infants. It's white light used to treat the winter blues, but I'm not going to talk about that. And it's laser surgery, which you, uh, we will talk about. So let's go to the first one, which is non-laser light. Uh, and here is a, a, a male uh, patient who has a rather nasty case of psoriasis. Uh, in a normal human, uh, you produce new skin cells all of the time in the, uh, the epithelial layer of the skin. Uh, in, it's called the basal layer. And these new skin cells, when they're formed, are globular, spherical, and they move towards the surface. So their basal cells, uh, when they, basal skin, when they start out, uh, they're on the move, they're called squamous cells. And when they reach the surface, they're dead, and they just drop off, and they're flat. They're, they're the scales that we lose. Most household dust is actually the dead skin cells of the inhabitants. And if you traveled here on the tube by any chance, kind of grime you see on the surfaces is really the dead skin cells of the, of the, the passengers, your fellow passengers, and you, and you. And well, in a, from birth to arrival at the surface in a normal human takes 28 days. If you have psoriasis, you're overproducing the, the skin cells. And when they arrive at the outside surface, they're not yet dead. Now, it's not life-threatening, this, but it's not very pleasant because this is very sensitive skin that you have on the outside. You don't have that protective layer. And what is done in the PUVA treatment is to sensitize the skin either through an injection or topically. Uh, a, a substance which absorbs ultraviolet light, turn on a UV lamp, and all of these skin cells die and drop off. And so for a period of time, the skin is normal, but it's, it's a treatment of a symptom, not a treatment of the cause of the disease. Uh, so you have to have it on a fairly regular basis. Similar treatment, but different uh, medical condition, if you like, is vitiligo. You have pigmented cells in your skin, melanocytes, which have melanin in them. Uh, and under the action of sunlight, of course, they're the ones that turn brown. Uh, 
uh, in a, if you lose that pigment, then you get a white patch. And I think many of the older people in the audience here will know that that's quite common to see white patches on your skin. It doesn't hurt you at all, there's no problem. But if you have a pigmented skin, particularly if you're young, it's really very disfiguring. Treatment is the same. You simply use an ultraviolet laser and this sensitizing dye, which destroys the outer layer of the skin and underneath the skin for a while is perfectly normal. So that, again, is treating the symptom. Here we're going to see that we can treat the cause. If you uh, want to taste some bacteria, just run your tongue over your teeth and what you're tasting is that stuff, plaque, which is the living, dying and dead bacteria in your mouth. You have more than 500 different types of bacteria in your mouth alone. Uh, what makes you recognizably you and uniquely you is the DNA in your cells um, for every one of your cells that you're walking around with, there are something like nine bacterial cells in your body. Most of you, in fact, is not you. Uh, so what can these bacteria do in the mouth? They're the results of two bacteria shown here. This is Streptococcus mutans, which turns sugar into acid and eats through the enamel, tooth decay, and this, you can see that the gum is receding here. Uh, that's gingival gingivitis, pyroformis gingivalis is the bacterium which causes that. And if this is not treated, your teeth will just fall out. Uh, if this is not treated, then it's very painful and your tooth will have to be extracted. So either way, it's not good news. So how can you treat this? Well, we use... Uh, the old Roman method of a, a physical action to dislodge a lot of these bacteria. Uh, but we try and augment it by using a, a bactericide in toothpaste. We actually tried to use a clever system using light. Now, what we did was the result, this is not a, a, an oral bacteria. This is uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, which are acquired hospital infection was, was really quite, quite nasty, caused a lot of deaths. And in this case, on a, on a, in a laboratory experiment, we had just, under, just over uh, 800, 800, can't count, 100 million of these bacteria alive. We added a small amount of a sensitizing dye, irradiated for about uh, uh, 30 seconds or thereabouts, and all of the bacteria effectively died. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a very useful way of sterilizing the mouth. We even went as far as inventing and patenting a laser toothbrush. Uh, so out of the bristles of the toothbrush came red laser light, which is what one needed. Uh, we failed because we couldn't get a toothpaste manufacturer to put this absorbing dye into the toothpaste. Uh, they said it was too expensive. It was, actually, it was actually this dye here that I got. All right. <clears throat> so killing bacteria is, is something of, of enormous importance. It's of use in dentistry. It is of use in, in uh, surgery also. Uh, and particularly since we're, the, the antibiotics we're using are becoming uh, ineffective in, in treating uh, some bacterial infections. And so any new strategy should have some use. Let's talk about lasers in, in medical use. Uh, a, an infrared laser, a, a heat laser if you like, uh, this is at very long wavelength, um, is really just pure infrared. It's a good cutting device. Uh, a YAG laser uh, is much nearer the visible part of the spectrum uh, but is, uh, again, widely used, and it's used for soft tissue laser surgery. Ultraviolet lasers, some of you may have had this. Excimer lasers are, are, are around just over between 200, 300 nanometers, that sort of region, uh, and up to 350, actually. Uh, and they're used for tissue ablation. You shine the laser on a tissue and it just vanishes with no heat produced. The tissue just disappears. 
uh, and it's used for corrective eye surgery for that reason. Uh, you can reshape the cornea of your eye so that it focuses light onto the retina, uh, and you do that using uh, an, an ultraviolet uh, laser. People have seemed quite alarmed that ultraviolet lasers are extremely powerful. They, they cause a lot of damage to anything they fall on, but they do not penetrate tissue. So it's only the first micron or so of tissue which ablates, which disappears. And so in the right hands, you can reshape a cornea uh, quite nicely. And so you don't have to wear specs anymore. Diode lasers, like the one I have in my hand, uh, is used for, are used for photodynamic therapy. We're coming to that. Femtosecond just means it's very short, high intense pulses of light, uh, which are used for two photon excitation. And I'll mention that in just a minute. And then there are all sorts of cosmetic uh, uses of lasers and various lasers used. If you open any Sunday paper now, you will see all sorts of adverts for cosmetic uses of lasers. And some medical colleagues of mine say, that the only known effect of the treatments which are advertised is on your wallet rather than your person. You know, it, there, there are wild claims made, most of which are not substantiated. But this is a use, one of the first uses of lasers, in fact, in Southampton uh, General Hospital. Uh, this is a lady with a port wine stain. Uh, it's not life-threatening. It's just very uncomfortable for her to look like that. And this is blood or blood vessels, and you need to try and remove that coloration. But what color laser would you use? Uh, what color laser is that? I'm, I, sh I shouldn't give this lecture. I'm totally red, green, color blind. So what color is that one? Red. I shouldn't be, shouldn't be using that one at all then. Uh, it's a green one that I want, and I haven't got one out here. So. Um, Use a green laser, green because red coloration absorbs green light. Uh, and then after a single treatment, you can see a lot of the color has gone. And this lady is now starting to smile. Well, she's an English lady, you see. So. <laughs> now, I, I can, infrared lasers are used for, as cutting devices. And if, if you've bitten your tongue recently, you know that your tongue bleeds quite readily. Uh, so tongue surgery can use infrared lasers to affect. Because it's infrared, it's heat, it cauterizes as it cuts, so there's no bleeding. It's, it's bloodless surgery, if you like. Well, this fellow has a large tumor here, uh, which if not treated uh, will kill him. Uh, normal treatment would be to remove the tongue, which would be pretty disastrous for a patient. And what was done in this case was to bloodlessly cut away the tumor. If you feel at all squeamish, don't look at the next slide, which shows that being cut away, being rotated through 90 degrees, unfortunately, but that's just cutting out the tumor, uh, and there's no bleeding at all. It cauterizes as it cuts. This is what was removed, very large tumor. Note it was made in the United States of America. And the good news is this same patient, some six years later, bit of scar tissue there, regeneration. That patient was still alive and therefore was completely cured, you could say. Well, that's a rather crude use in, in chemical terms of a, of a laser. Let's move to something a little bit more sophisticated. I'll do this first, actually. Uh, if you smoke cigarettes, uh, you stand a, a, an enhanced chance, a much enhanced chance of dying what I think is one of the most miserable and degrading deaths you could invent for yourself. Uh, upper resp respiratory tract cancer, including lung cancer. And here's a patient in University College Hospital where the tumor has grown at the, this is the trachea, these are the bronchi. This, this lung is completely blocked by the tumor. That tiny little passageway there is the only way this guy can breathe. And that's the hole for real, as seen in an endoscope. With a, a powerful laser, you can blast away that tissue. And so the airways become open. And you might say, hooray. But this fellow was dead within two months anyway, because by the time you exhibit lung cancer uh, symptoms, you will have secondary tumors elsewhere in the body, which is what will finish you off, which is what happened to him. 
So a much cleverer way of do, using lasers is to use a dye stuff which absorbs light and turns on some chemistry which destroys surrounding tissue. And this is called photodynamic therapy, and I've been involved for the last sort of 30 years in, in doing this. Um, and the, the, the treatment of bacteria I showed you is, is a, another example of PDT. So how does it work? Well, here's a patient uh, who has improbably, the artist didn't understand uh, the major use when he was drawn, improbably in his leg has a tumor growing, right? And we want to destroy that. So we inject into the bloodstream a dye stuff which will be absorbed or retained preferentially in the tumor tissue. So within two heartbeats, that dye has diffused throughout the body, through the bloodstream. Uh, and if you wait a little while, you see there's more of this uh, dye stuff in the tumor than there is anywhere else except the liver. You cannot use this treatment on the liver because the normal liver has a, is, is the excretory method of removing this dye. So the, the, uh, the liver will always have a, normal liver will have a lot of dye in it. But there's a targeted tumor, so then you simply put red laser light, so it is the appropriate color this time, uh, into the dye, so the dye must absorb red light, so it has to be blue or green in color, uh, and that turns on some chemistry. Uh, there's the dye absorbing the light. It actually produces a special form of oxygen called singlet oxygen, which is the, the therapeutic agent. That is what kills the cell. And so you destroy that tumor, uh, you cannot get resistance to it because uh, you can't get resistance to singlet oxygen. Uh, and also you turn on a process called apoptosis, which destroys uh, cell signaling inside the cell will uh, result in an amplification of the damage. So a damaged cell will signal to surrounding cells that they should kill themselves, and, and that sort of amplifies the damage. It's called apoptosis. So <clears throat> let's just have a look at a little of this. Here is a patient who has been targeted using the, the dye. Uh, you turn whatever color the dye is, not as, not as dramatically as that. And then you can look for the, where the dye is by using fluorescence, because these are chosen to be uh, fluorescent uh, dies. Uh, and this one, which one have I got? This is the amphiphilic one, I think. But uh, can you see just, if I put it against there, can you see a dark red fluorescence there? So if you looked for the fluorescence, you can see where the dye is, and that tells you where to point the laser. Um, so uh, these mice have been injected in the base of their tails with a uh, a dye stuff. It's a different fluorophore than the one I've shown you. Uh, and so where there's no fur, you can see he fluoresces quite brightly. Uh, and so he would all over his skin. These are normal mice, um, but you can't see it for the, for the, for the fur. Uh, they hate being injected in the base of their tails, and so we resort to subterfuge, as you can see there, to get them to accept it. <laughs> now, what is the effect of this? This is a patient who has a basal cell carcinoma, skin cancer caused by, almost certainly by exposure to sunlight. Uh, it does not metastasize. It does not move to other organs of the body. It simply uh, will grow in situ, already quite large. If, you, if nothing was done, it would simply envelop a large part of her face. Normal surgery would dig deep to remove all of the tumor tissue so it doesn't regrow. She'd certainly lose the bridge of her nose. She might lose that eye. Uh, and it's, it's a very disfiguring operation. What was actually done was to use a sensitizer of the sort I've just shown you, this actual material, uh, and two irradiations of about 30 minutes of red light, which doesn't cause you any harm, unless where the sensitizer is present, and you can see the result. Uh, it's hard to see even where the tumor was. 
So why isn't this lady smiling broadly? Well, she's a Russian lady, and they didn't smile too much. Uh, something to um, alarm the, the males in the audience. Uh, you want to get light in the body. If it's to the skin, uh, it's easy, of course. It's easily accessible. Uh, if it's in a hollow organ, you simply use one of these, which is uh, an endoscope. Now, this one's a gastroscope, so it goes through the mouth, down as far as the, just about as far as the duodenum. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to volunteer, <laughs> even though I have cleaned it. But can you see, when I imagine it's now down in, in my insides, and I can steer it in any direction I want. Can you, can you observe that, the way it's being steered? So you can look around corners inside the body. And, of course, what you then do is you put a high-powered laser down here, uh, and do the chemistry that you want in situ. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a gastroscope. The bigger brother, of course, is, is a colonoscope. No prizes for guessing where that goes. Uh, and this is an old-fashioned one, I have to say. This is a bundle of about 10,000 individual fibers down which the light goes and is, is recovered. A modern uh, endoscope would use a CCD camera chip on the, on the end and give you a, re a resolution equivalent to 100,000 of these fibers, but it can be very small. So if, if, you're, if you have to have endoscopy of any form, make sure you go to a hospital which has the most modern endoscopes which are available. It'll be a much more comfortable experience for you, I think. Right. Um, so this gentleman that you see on the slide here, again, this is uh, University College Hospital with whom I had a long collaboration. Uh, he's got a, a much smaller version of this endoscope inserted in an obvious place because he's suffering from bladder cancer. Uh, it's a form of bladder cancer which does not metastasize. It stays local but has to be treated periodically. So the before and after are not very dramatic. That's, that's the wall of the bladder, and that is a tumor which is growing relatively slowly, but has to be treated. This is after the PDT treatment, and that tissue is now all dead, so it just falls away and is excreted in the normal way. Uh, in fact, so happy is this gentleman with his treatment, he's quite happy to look down the endoscope <laughs> into his own <laughs> bladder. And again, he's a, he's a smiler, yeah. So what is current PDT? It's about 50,000 patients worldwide have been treated using this technique. Uh, and I'll show you one which is really not very nice. Uh, this is a tumor under the tongue, almost certainly caused by smoking cigarettes or drinking strong alcohol. Uh, and this is before TDT. Now, that's a very aggressive tumor, which will kill the patient within, within months, certainly. Uh, what was done was to use PDT, uh, red light, and that's the, the ne necrotic area of, of the tumor. This is one week later. This is now dead tissue. Uh, this is three weeks later, you've got some regeneration. And six months later, you've got complete regeneration of the tongue. Uh, and no tumor. No, the tumor has been eradicated. And think of the, uh, the benefit of that compared with surgery, which is, is pretty brutal. Well, are there any problems with PDT? And the answer is, well, that's the mechanism. Uh, this is just the dye which absorbs light and ultimately produces this special form of oxygen, singlet oxygen, which, which is what kills the tissue. <coughs> there is a problem in that if you just use a, a dye stuff like the ones I've just shown you, then in a, an organ which has got a tumor in it, the concentration of the dye in the tumor is only about two or three times the concentration in normal tissue. So if you then spray a laser around, you will do some damage to the normal tissue as well as the tumor. And so the question is, can we make it a much more selective process? And this is what my own research has been doing for the last 10 years or so. So how would you tackle that? You can use a monoclonal antibody, which targets something on tumor tissue, which is not present on normal tissue. You can be smarter than that and use an antibody fragment, 
which is uh, what we do. Uh, you can use two-photon excitation, which is again what we do, uh, and there's a whole literature on using proteins, folic acid, nanoparticles to, to achieve the targeting. So I haven't got time to go through that, so I'll just tell you a little bit about ours. This is, uh, uh, this is a glycoprotein, HER2, which is overexpressed in uh, invasive breast tumors and many epithelial cancers. And we use a monoclonal antibody fragment which targets HER2. And this is just another one. I won't go into the chemistry of how we make it. This is what it looks like. This is the, an this is the monoclonal antibody, the fragment. And these are the dye stuffs which have been added uh, in various places. And we can get up to 13, usually about 10 dyes attached to one monoclonal. So locally, we have a very high concentration of this dye, but none elsewhere in the body. So it's, it's a, a very good targeting uh, regime. 50 to 60 uh, to 1 uh, in favor of the tumor compared with the normal tissue. Uh, right. So does it work? Well, yes, it does. Um, this is three mice that have a human tissue, uh, human cancer. Uh, the free sensitizer doesn't do much. It slows the growth down for a while and then the growth takes off. But if you target it in the way that we did, you completely eradicate the tumor within a couple of weeks. So that it's much, much better than conventional PDT using these, these uh, targets. And I don't know why that's there, but I think I... Two-photon excitation is another way, and we don't have time to talk about that. But all this shows is that we have used one of the dyes made by my colleagues in Oxford University, Harry Anderson, and we've looked at a blood vessel, and with two photons, which are infrared photons, not, not uh, ultraviolet, you can actually seal the blood vessel, so you starve the blood supply to the tumor, and you kill the tumor that way, and that works quite well. But it's another example of photochemistry, if you like. So I realize I'm going to outstay my welcome if I don't get a move on, so let me move to the last thing that I wanted really to show you, to try and convince you that unconventional chemistry, if you, if you like, has, has application in the, in the real world. And this is uh, the treatment of neonatal jaundice. We make new red blood cells all of the time, uh, and we recycle the old ones by breaking them down and using uh, the materials to make the new ones. And one of the breakdown products of red blood cells is a bright yellow substance called bilirubin. Uh, it's a porphyrin molecule, uh, and we excrete it because you have in your liver and bile an enzyme which takes bilirubin in its normal form, which does not dissolve in water. You, the enzyme makes it into a water-soluble form, and so you excrete it, in urine and in, in stools. If you think about a baby before it's born, it doesn't excrete anywhere. It's the mother which excretes. So babies, when they're born, do not have this enzyme. And therefore, they have to develop it in the first couple of days of life. And then they can uh, quite happily excrete their, their bilirubin. And newborn babies have a tremendous turnover of red blood cells because they're growing very fast. So uh, if you have any liver malfunction, which is quite common in, in, uh, in uh, premature babies, but actually quite common in normal babies as well, you might, you might uh, not develop this enzyme for a while. It's fat soluble, this yellow stuff. You have a lot of fat just under your skin and that's where it goes, and hence the yellow color. Jaundice is just, just means you've turned yellow. Well, this remarkable lady shown on the slide here, uh, her name is Judith Ward. She was a, a maternity uh, sister in an Essex hospital, and she used to take babies out into the sunshine because she thought it was good for them. So she'd take them out, strip them down to their nappies, lie them in the sun, presumably in the summer and not in the winter uh, in Essex. Uh, and no one thought much of it until one day 
Uh, she took the baby back in because there was a ward inspection by a doctor. Uh, the doctor removed the nappy, and where the sunlight had not penetrated, he was a bright yellow color. Uh, the rest of his skin was normal Caucasian. Uh, and the, 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 the medic uh, realized that this was a way of treating. He didn't understand the chemistry, but this was a way of treating neonatal jaundice which, if untreated in severe cases, will kill the child. So it had to be, had to be done. So this was in about 1955, 6. Within a, a couple of years throughout the Western world, this was a form of therapy, which you will still see in maternity hospitals today. You simply irradiate a baby with blue light. Why blue? Well, the yellow color, is, it's yellow because the dye which is there is absorbing red and, and uh, uh, red and blue light. Red is the most blue is the most energetic, so it's convenient to use blue light. And so you will see about 10% of all babies when they're first born will have this simple treatment. Now you see my nephew uh, having his strong family resemblance, I'm sure you will recognize. <laughs> uh, they cover the eyes just to be on the safe side because blue light is quite energetic. Uh, and sometimes there's a little bit of ultraviolet light in the, in the, in the lamp. And after a few treatments, the, the baby develops the enzyme. You don't need any, any further treatment. So I thought it might be nice to finish off. Uh, oh, incidentally, the chemistry is there for any chemist amongst you. This is Billy Rubin, and it has... Uh, I keep losing the... What is this one? It has two double bonds there and there. And it has carboxylic acid groups elsewhere. And all that happens when you shine a light on this baby is that you cis-trans isomerize about that double bond, open the molecule out, and it then becomes water-soluble. Uh, it's it's uh, been an interesting investigation to get that far. So I thought it might be nice to finish off by showing you a real baby having uh, this treatment. And all the time I've been speaking uh, in here, there has been a baby sleeping, and here he is, <laughs> my pride and joy. This is, uh, this is Mike, and I call him Mike because he was made the first baby I ever had, which was broken some time ago. Uh, I called Bobbit, and we won't go into that, but, um, but that was made by a, a glassblower in the University of Southampton called uh, Mike uh, Kaplan who sadly died of cancer about 10 years ago. So when my next generation baby was smashed to pieces by British Airways in, en route to Berlin, the people in Southampton heard about this and unknown to me, made me a new baby, uh, rather handsome baby, I think. Very well endowed, you notice. <laughs> and. Uh, so we, we, we christened him Mike in honor of the, the, the glassblower who made the first one. Well, what's remarkable about uh, Mike is that in his legs, he has the authentic material, bilirubin, in its fat-soluble form, which causes jaundice in newborn babies. And I want to show you that he can't remove it. Uh, so I'm going to, if I can find a... Uh, I should have a funnel somewhere, because otherwise I'll spill it all. Odd. Maybe it's in the maybe it's in the case. Let me have a look. I know if I try and pour that in here, uh, I'll make a mess. Ah, there we go. Right. So I'm going to lie him down up here. Uh, actually, you won't be able to see, will you? So I'll move it along here. I'm going to give him a drink of water. And. He drinks through a funnel, but doesn't complain. And when I hold him up, the water layer will be the top layer. And if this works, and I normally have a bit more time to prepare it, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> 
you'll get the principle anyway. All right. Now if I hold him up, can you see that the yellow color is still in the legs? It hasn't dissolved in the water, so this is still a severely jaundiced baby. All right? And the treatment, a la Judith Ward, is simply to use an ultraviolet lamp, which is what you see in, in hospitals. I have to irradiate him. I'll do it from the back because it can get closer. I have to irradiate for two minutes, and then it's just about finished. And that cis-trans isomerization reaction should be sufficient to make some of this, at any rate, water-soluble. And because we're running out of time, I can't do it for very long, so I just hope that it works. Um, let's give it a try now. I have to do something now I wouldn't dare do in Massachusetts. I have to shake the baby violently. <laughs> and if it's successful, then, and I think it has been, as you can see, can you see that the yellow color has now migrated into the water layer? It's water-soluble. So now he can do exactly what you do. <laughs> well, those of you whose physiology resembles this, anyway, and can excrete his bilirubin. So I hope you've enjoyed this little excursion into a, a form of chemistry which you may not have been familiar with and see how useful it is. And I hope also you can understand why I now call this lecture a little light relief. Thank you very much indeed. Thank <laughs> you.